Good evening to all of you joining us for this exciting and informative night and uh, celebration of civil rights. We're going to start off, as we always do, with a little bit of singing. I don't know what your day was like, but there was song in mind as I did a performance this afternoon actually talking about history and race. And that always includes the civil rights movement and the amazing, brave, courageous, wise folks who helped to change the world by helping America to face itself. So settle into your seat and get ready for an exciting, amazing evening. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table. Feel free to sing along, cause these songs are made to sing together. Well, I'm gonna sit at the welcome table. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table one of these days. Hallelujah. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table. I'm gonna sit at the definitely feel free to join in and release whatever it was about your day that was perhaps an obstacle. You're going to hear some stuff tonight, some things tonight that hopefully are going to inspire and fuel your soul for your soul and your body. song from the Underground Railroad that was also sung in the movement. We know that the struggle is long and hard. As we like to say, the struggle continues. So we know that we have to wade in the water. Who were those children all dressed in red? God's gonna trouble the water. They must be the ones that the water well, who with those children all are dressed in white God's gonna trouble the water they must be the ones getting ready to fly God's gonna trouble them sing it with me say wait in the water Sing it over, 
wherever you are. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. Hey, God's gonna trouble the water, children. Say, wait in the water. Wait, oh, children, now wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the Set free, God's gonna trouble the water. It's up to you, it's up to me. God's gonna trouble the water, children. Say, you don't believe, be redeemed. God's gonna trouble the water. Just follow me down to the Jordan Street. God's gonna trouble the water, children. Say, wait in the water. We will not rest till the storm is over. We will not lay this burden down. We will keep each other strong. We will love and carry on till we stand all together on solid ground. Been a long, hard journey on a winding road. So many have gone before us. They carried a heavy load, but they went there singing as they made their way. Now it's in their footsteps we follow as we work today. We will not rest till the storm is over. We will not lay this burden down. We will keep each other strong. We will love and carry on till we stand all together on solid ground. Till we stand all together on solid ground. Till we stand all together on solid ground. Well, thank you again for joining us tonight for this second program in the fall webinar series with the Living Legacy Project. And we are so happy to be bringing these to you as a, uh, a way to enlighten and inspire. And certainly as you join us tonight, we hope that you are understanding that the road to freedom and justice is a long and hard struggle, but we make it, we can make that struggle as has been so demonstrated by those in the civil rights movement and by our esteemed guests tonight, because they not only kept one foot in front of each other and kept their eyes on the prize, but also because they realized that we do not make this journey alone that we have the voices and the arms and the legs of so many who have committed themselves to the struggle. 
So thank you so much for the generosity and the spirit that you have brought to not only our webinars, but to the mission of the Living Legacy Project as we seek to entertain and inform. And I'd like to welcome our hosts this evening, a colleague of mine and a long, long, long time soldier in the war on civil rights, Pam Zepardino. Thank you, Reggie. Um, it's an absolute thrill to be here tonight. Um, it's going to be a wonderful program. Um, for those of you who don't know the Living Legacy Project, our vision is a world where there is equity, where there is justice, where people of uh, different backgrounds and different cultures and different ethnic groups and different races um, all have the same rights and privileges and work with each other um, to make the world better for all of us. And so our mission is partly being fulfilled by what you're seeing tonight. We um, want to make sure that everyone understands what happened in the civil rights movement and what that means for today. We're not just about the history, all the history is incredibly important, but that history has a message for us today and how we can work in our communities today. And so our mission is to provide education, mostly experiential education, webinars, pilgrimages to places in the South, mostly where um, major events happen during the civil rights movement. So you all, if you're with us, can understand how that all came together and how you might be able to take lessons back to your own community. And so that's that's what we're about. Um, if you've been on one of our pilgrimages before, Thank you, and we'd love to see you again, because you might not have been on one that goes to some of the places we go to now. And if you haven't, check out our website, um, because there are a lot of um, interesting things on there, former webinars, uh, prior webinars that you might be interested in. And if you enjoy uh, tonight's program, if you take something from it, we hope you will support our work. We are a volunteer organization. And um, so we live by donations. Um, and our uh, operations director, Annette, will put a, a, a link in the chat um, at some point this evening where you can make a donation if you'd care to. Um, because uh, we want to keep our buses on the road, our uh, Zoom channel working, and um, we want to bring more people into this work. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce you to tonight's guest, um, who I am so honored to be here with, Mr. Dave Dennis Sr., who uh, was an important part of the civil rights movement work especially in Louisiana and Mississippi. Um, not that he didn't get other places, but um, uh, tonight we're going to be talking about some of his journey, uh, how he got involved, um, how he sees the work that he did coming forward and how we can take that forward. And also, um, sort of winding through this is going to be the fact that he and a guy named Dave Dennis Jr. So um, that would be his son. Um, he and his son have written a book about his experience. So we'll chat a little bit about that as well. But welcome, Mr. Dennis. We are thrilled to have you here. Good to be here. And I, I'd like to get started because um, you, you grew up, uh, you were born in Louisiana. You grew up there and um, you were about, as I, as I figured it out, you were probably about the same age as Emmett Till. 
um, pretty close. Right. And uh, and and we know that that he was murdered in 1955. But there were lots of other things that were going on at that point in time that were an attempt to keep the races separate and attempt uh, to keep white supremacy in power. And I'm wondering how that all came together for you as you were growing up. Well, the, the uh, I was like uh, most black people at that time, I think, is who was trying to figure out how to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, I was born and raised on the uh, first nine years of my life on the plantation. And so in a place called Tallulah, Louisiana, and then outside of Shreveport, Louisiana. So the life, my first school I ever went to was a, was a one room uh, building house uh, with the old pot stove, the things you read about and some things that people don't believe happened, but it's a pot stove. And I was in a room at that time is, I was around six or seven years old, but we had people for 18, 19 years ago, the basics of teaching and learning was around uh, reading, writing, and what they call arithmetic. Uh, because the fact is that that's what you need just in terms of survival. And so that beginning of my life is, is that's what I came up with is watching, uh, you know, picking cotton and uh, uh, we had no lights. Uh, I was nine years old before I was exposed to even inside toilets, so, you know, running water and things of that nature. So that was a way of life. So in addition to that is it was, it was pretty much conditioned. And I was one of those people's conditioned uh, around survival and doing what is necessary to survive. For instance, when Emmett Till was killed, uh, I saw I was shown the pictures by the neighborhood. So we actually, I grew up, although we were poor, after left the plantation, moved to a place in Shreveport, Louisiana called Cedar Grove. Uh, even there is, it was a while before we had running water, even in the area that we lived in, although we lived in the city, we still had outside toilet and things of that nature. Um, but when Emmett Till killed, died, the men took the boys, the black boys, to a church and told us what to do and what not to do in order to survive so that we didn't end up like Emmett Till. So if you saw a white woman walking down the street, uh, someplace you crossed the street. You did not look them in the eye. You did not do anything that one might think uh, accused you of being flirtatious or whatever nature that. And you didn't make sure how you how you spoke to people at that time is white people is. It was some people were uh, young people would get you could get beaten by saying properly yes sir or yes ma'am you know so you had to do the draw thing you would talk you know how to say yasum no no sir you know. Uh, because you had to play the role, because they didn't, anything outside of that role could get you killed in those particular days, is or beaten, or going to jail, or whatever you have it. So, actions around survival. So, I grew up uh, not understanding a lot about, you know, the uh, civil rights movement, uh, that type of protest. Although some things happened in my life is that to demonstrate to me a different type of protest that. Uh, Black people were involved in. So we we, we we part of a protest from the time that Black people came here as enslaved people, using different types of things at the same time as figuring out how to survive as you do with personal types of protests. So that's how I grew up. I had no interest in becoming involved in the civil rights movement until I entered college at uh, Dillard University, and that's another story. So that's I didn't know the, 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 the people ask me all the time is as if we did you have this burning fire and anger, you know. Uh, I won't call it, uh, it was anger in the senses, but at the same time, that one that, that took me out of my lane from at that time is what I had felt I had to do in order to survive. It's interesting. It's very much what we hear today, what um, everyone who is friends with African-American families, that the talk happens. Um, very much like you were told that that families talk with their children, especially 
um, male children about, you know, what you say to a police officer, what you don't say to a police officer. So it seems like that not much has changed in that sense. Well, I think that what has changed a lot is the concept of family Hmm. in the Black community pieces. I came from a single parent home. Uh, All the things that people say that should happen is to cause you not to be successful and to end up, you know, uh, in jail or whatever you have. Um, The concept of family was different when I grew up. Uh, We actually had real communities when I grew up. There was the black communities. And so Mr. Jack, who lived down the street, was like a father to me, isn't he? He had the right and permission from my parents, my mother and my grandparents, to jack me up if I did something wrong down the street. So it's all in terms of love because we had the idea the young people were taught to respect your elders. And we respect our elders and at the same time reverse is the elders respected the children. So if you did something good, you got rewarded for it. And if you did something bad, you, the community uh, let you know about it. So what I'm trying to say is that, that we had uh, this, this, this camaraderie that we had is the family that we had came out of, uh, you know, how we were forced to live. I mean, the first thing happened when black people were brought here as enslaved people the families were broken up. I mean, uh, fathers were sent someplace else and mothers were sent someplace else. And a lot of times the children were taken from the arms of their mothers and sent someplace else as enslaved people. So we learned, I mean, and taught and began to live the way whereby the children became the children of the community, not just of any one particular biological parent. So that's what I grew up with, is, which caused me to be strengthened, I think, is and was protected. And we were protected uh, by the elders within the community. So you you mentioned that you got involved in the civil rights movement when you were in college. Um, How did you get started? Well, uh, a lot of it has to do with fate. So I'm going to have to go back a little bit now. So uh, I believe, and my, my grandmother always told me that, you know, you're here for a particular purpose on this earth. All human beings are. So what that is, you find out as the longer you live. And so once you finish serving that purpose, you know, then pretty soon life is over with you. But you're here for a purpose. And so I didn't understand what she meant about that is, you know, but as I think about my involvement in the movement and the, how I got here, things begin to happen. I went from one school to the other. I was went to a boarding school for a reason. I don't know how, why I got there, but to a large extent because we were poor. I ended up at this Catholic boarding school. I ended up from there is, uh, for my senior year, I had I was taken out of boarding school and lived with my aunt in Baton Rouge. And I went to a place called Southern Lab School with Southern University. So here I am is for the second walkout, which is one of the largest walkouts in, in history and civil rights movement from colleges at Southern University. The lab school was right there on the campus there. And so as they marched by, my best friend, uh, in that in school, uh, he, we were sitting outside, and his brother was leading the march and said, come on, come on, join us. And we said no. So we went over to my best friend's house and played basketball. And so I had we didn't get involved in that movie. We didn't want to do that. Well, show you how fate was touching me on the shoulder because my best friend at that time was a person by the name of Hubert Brown, later on to be known as H. Rap Brown. You know, and so we went our separate ways, and I went to Diller University. I got involved there is that I'm, when I get on camp, got on campus, there were students who had been in jail at uh, uh, Diller University, Cesar Carter and some others. And then there was other students, from one from uh, Suno, uh, by the name of Raptor Castle, uh, who was a icon of the civil rights movement. It was a street uh, named after. And then there was uh, Rudy Lombard, who was the... Uh, uh, Big civil rights leader in, in core and people, and so and then Finch and others. And so these people, you know, were in jail, but I didn't want to have anything to do with the movement in a sense. I knew it was happening, sympathized, but I wanted to be an electrical engineer, make some money for my parents and my mother and stuff is to help her out. 
and also to make some money, you know, so I never have to go back on the plantation not realizing what the plantation that meant to me. One day I was walking across campus, and so there was a rally on campus, under the flagpole at Dillard University is, and there was this young lady who was speaking. And so I walked by and said, well, let me go up here. And I stopped and turned around and went back to talk to see what's going on is. But I wouldn't go back so much to hear what she was saying. She looked good. I was going to go back and try to get a date with her. And so I went to talk. When she finished, I went to talk to her to get a date. To, well, make a long story short, she convinced me to go with her to a meeting, uh, which ended up to be at Mount Zion Baptist Churches, which was also where it found out was the church where a Southern Christian Leadership Conference was founded okay, in New Orleans. And there I am with these people who became late on known as very icons of the civil rights movement in New Orleans and Louisiana, and also the, on the national level. Is. And so I was chasing this young lady whose name was Doris Castle, who happens to have been the sister of this icon civil rights leader <laughs> in, uh, in New Orleans, Louisiana. And so the rest became history to a large extent. And so my chase and Doris, who kept challenging me, and I kept trying to get a date, she would not date to him until finally. She convinced me to go on a, uh, a uh, sit-in. They were doing sit-ins and demonstrations in New Orleans at that time. And so I decided to go. So, but they weren't arresting people. They would warn them. And the idea was what they call hidden runs. You sit at a lunch counter. Police come you know, and be on a Saturday. And so that would keep the traffic, the people going into the store. We got police around, so people didn't want to trouble. So it was, it was an effective boycott. Uh, and so this would be an effect. So I said, well, if I, I'm going to go on this because maybe Doris will go on a date with me if I go on with these demonstrations. They're not going to jail anyway, right? And so I did, on the day that I decided, I put on that time in, she wore a little suit and tie, you know, coat, and, and I dressed up and I was ready to go and said, I'm being be impressive, finished to her. Well, lo and behold, uh, of course, that's the same day that the police in the city decided they're tired of this stuff. They ain't gonna do no warning. They're gonna come in and arrest everybody. So I ended up, my first demonstration, going to jail, all right? So that was the beginning of my uh, involvement in the movement uh, at that time. And so that's how I really began to get started. I got my feet wet. It wasn't because of uh, inside commitment to the movement. It was because I was trying to get a date. Which says is that, you don't know where it is, uh, where it's going to hit you, you know. Uh, and it reminded me of the old Baptist when I grew up, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, whereby you sat on the morning's bench and the preacher would preach and try to get you to join church. And my grandmother used to say, "One day it would hit you." And it took me a long time to deal with that issue. So, and so when the movement kind of stuff is, you don't know when it's going to hit you. So that was the beginning, but that wasn't exactly where it hit me, as the rest is, but it was got me into a position whereby it did hit me a little bit later on. I, in, in your book, you talk about a, a time when being arrested didn't bother you anymore, and you were actually ready to go. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, that happened in some very interesting pieces where I'll talk about fate. So at the time, I've got to go back a little bit here too. So at the time that we were in uh, this demonstration in New Orleans, we were talking about, CORE has started to freedom rise uh, from Washington, D.C. and the host mm -hmm. uh, for the group that was supposed to be for the uh, freedom rise was the New Orleans CORE chapter. Uh, uh, then, so. So we know the freedom I had started. So I come, I gotten out of jail and everything else. Now going back to school at Dillard University is staying on, try to keep myself out of trouble, getting ready for exams. And this is around April, May, when May rather was. And so um, what happened is that the uh, the buses were attacked in Addison, Alabama, and Birmingham, Alabama. We know that story, but part of the a lot of the people there on that on the bus, especially Addison, Alabama. And Birmingham were beaten and very badly and injured very badly. To the and they could not find medical get medical attention um, where they were either Birmingham or in Anniston, Alabama. So they had to get them out of the areas and sent them into New Orleans. And so uh, we were able to find um, 
uh, doctors in New Orleans, uh, there was a hospital, a black hospital called Flint Goodrich Hospital in New Orleans because black doctors, even at that particular time, uh, were not uh, allowed to practice in white hospitals like the charity hospitals. So they had to practice in a black hospital, which is Flint Goodrich, which so happened was uh, connected to Dillard University at the time. So that's where we were able to get treatment for them, and they were able to stay, put, put found house, and for them at Xavier University in New Orleans at that time. And so when these people came in, they were like, you know, really uh, beaten up and stuff. Is what well, the untold story is: these three of those people, uh, four, I think it was, of those people in those original, uh, on those original two buses in Birmingham and uh, Anderson, Alabama, eventually died as a result of the injuries they received in those buses that we don't uh, read about and talk about. So at any rate is that there were two things going on at the same time is there was a group out of, there was an issue about whether or not the ride should continue. And there was a group out of Nashville, Tennessee, young people led by Diane Nash, James Bevel and some others. Um, and um, there was a group out of New Orleans also, uh, that was also demanding that the rise continue. And that was led by Aretha Castle, these, these two fantastic black women who was taking on this leadership. Uh, the, uh, Aretha Castle was doing, uh, having a, a discussion with, uh, with uh, Robert Kennedy. I think Diane Nash was dealing with Singapore, I think his name was. It was also the Attorney General's office pieces. And so that was this demand that the uh, uh, that the rides continued, and then they, and so uh, again, my following Doris, uh, uh, read that call us all to a meeting at her house, uh, which is where she lived with her mother and father, and about it, and what they call the Freedom House there, which is located at nine seventeen North Tonti. I still can remember the address. And so we, uh, uh, I decided to go on a ride. Uh, following Doris is still because still I've gotten a date, <clears throat> so she didn't think my going to jail at the time was enough, and so I ended up going on a ride. So there were five of us from New Orleans who decided that we wanted to go on the ride, and that was a group that came out of Nashville, Tennessee. So there was a meeting held in Montgomery, Alabama. We know about the church uh, where the King and them were trapped in the church by a mob of a Klansmen and others, and so we took a train from there to uh, to. Uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And we had this meeting, there was this big meeting at uh, Dr. Harris's house, who's a pharmacist, the black pharmacist there. And there were uh, uh, the, the federal government, uh, the candidates had called for uh, martial law. And it was really tough, I mean, when we got there. So we get there, it's been this building, and then I'm meeting for the first time all these icons. There's Abernathy, there was uh, King, there was uh, just you name them, uh, uh, Y.T. Walker, Andy Young, you know, all the people that I've heard about. And there they were, Diane Nash for the first time meeting her and James Bevel and the rest of them. And so we're sitting there in this room. And this is when it hit, when that we talk about what hits you, you never know. And so I'm debating whether or not I want to be number one, why am I here? I, I'm going to get back to school. I'm going to go to jail again. I never go to college. I, my, my career is over. You know, my mama didn't know where I was. She even though I had been arrested one time now. Now we're talking about a second time. You know? And so, so I was sitting in this room, you know, all of a sudden there was this, I, all I heard was someone say it loud and clear, you know, there's not enough space in this room for both God and fear. You know, for some reason, as it like hit me, just bam, right between the eyes. And before I knew it, my hand was up. I'm ready to go on the ride. And let's go. And so from that to it, it became the difference for my understanding between fear and being afraid. I can't say that I've never been afraid. And then I can't say I wasn't afraid then to move forward. Well, I didn't have that fear that paralyzes what you have is, so I didn't have the fear, so I separate the two. And with that piece is, I joined into the civil rights movement and never looked back. It was whatever hit me, uh, hit me in a way that, that changed my whole course of life is, I never even thought about it again as in terms of uh, what I should be doing. And so that was wow. the beginning of the making that particular mm -hmm. changes. When I talk about you don't know 
how it hits you, where you hit you, you know. Um, uh, but that's how I really got into it. And from that point, I went to Jackson, Mississippi, went to jail Parchment. And then from there, uh, they ended up uh, being arrested over 30 times uh, during my life. Wow. In it's interesting. I, I teach college students and, and I ask them if there was anything they'd be willing to go to jail for. And they look at me like, go to jail. Um, but, you know, I, I think they haven't found what hits them yet. Um, but, you know, very much they were like you originally were like, well, I've got my career and I've got all of this stuff to go through. But you went on and stayed as part of the movement, a very powerful part of the movement. Um, what what about your experience in the civil rights movement do you see as most life changing for you, most important for you? There is no one thing. Uh, I think it's a continuation, a mm -hmm. combination of a lot. Uh, and I think it had to do with, um, when I talk about this whole thing about family, you know, uh, uh, which is one of the things that really I think was amazing. We young people uh, did not start this movement. That's one thing needs to be clear about. When we came in, uh, like in Louisiana, there was already a movement going on in Louisiana. There was already a movement going on in Mississippi and Alabama. It was just a different type of a movement. Uh, Bob Moses used to talk about the Mississippi theater. That theater was there, so as we were young people, we began to move into the areas to do, uh, direct action. and We could do things that the elders could not do. It's, but we came in, the pathway had been already set. I mean, the stage had already been set. Uh, the play had begun. And we became supported actors into this play. And uh, and we became part of what, what was already there as a continuation. I mean, Mississippi, uh, what, what the way had been opened uh, those for ancestors for years and there is, but one of the most powerful people there, people like Medgar Evers and R.L. T. Smith and Amson Moore, you know, Louisiana is, is that I found out that one of the leaders was my dentist. As I grew up as a kid, you know, uh, was uh, one of the leaders and one of the founders of SCLC, Dr. C.O. Simpkins and others. So the movement had been, and then also the other fallacy we have to deal with the fact is, is what was made of the movement. The movement was, made us. We didn't make the movement. It was made of a cross-section of people. A uh, good example is what I mean by that cross section of the community. Uh, but it's uh, Mississippi. We always talk about these three fantastic women in Mississippi. One was, uh, and they represented what the movement's all about, as far as I'm concerned. One was Miss Fannie Lou Hamer, who was a sharecropper, and we know. And everybody knows of Miss Fannie Lou Hamer. Then there was another one in there who was a top leader, was a lady by the name of Miss Victoria Ray, who lived out of down in uh, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, who was actually from Virginia. And, and she was a school teacher. And then out of Canton, Mississippi, there was this powerful lady by the name of Miss Anna Devine. And Miss Anna Devine was a business lady and also insurance agency. So what she did was sold those 25 cent policy, but she knew everybody in the whole area around that place. But these three powerful women represented three sections of the community that we lived in. You know? Then you had the leaders of uh, uh, Dr. Aaron Henry out of Clarksdale was one of the leaders of the WACP. He was a pharmacist. Amzin Moore, who took Bob Moses in and taught him the ropes about what to do and how to do, how to organize in the area, all right, was worked for the post office and he owned a service station, he owned a home, right? And then uh, uh, you got uh, 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 the steptoes and people like that is, and the, but the, you had people, porters and people of that nature, then you had the grassroots people. So you had a cross section of people who made the movement, ministers and others, you know, and, and their children and families and pieces. And the family piece became, people always ask me, well, you got in Mississippi Freedom Summer, you brought in about a thousand kids. I mean, uh, how'd you do that? We were able to do that because of the people. They were they were housed by the local people. Poor people gave up their beds for these kids to come in and sleep and stuff like this. And, and they knew the danger it was. 
you know. And so they came in, they hit them, they fed them, you know, took care of them, protected them. And they knew that one of the days, a few months down there, is that these kids were going to get on that buses and stuff and leave them. And they were going to be down there by themselves. And they did it anyway. So the real heroes of the movement, like we, uh, it's a few of us who get a lot of credit. There's a lot of written about us, you know, about the movement. But we would, could not have done anything of, of what we've done, you know, without the support of the community and the people that, the, the, the real family. They took us in because we were like their children. You know, we were the extension of that family piece. And so we have to figure out a way as we think about this, as the movement is of all of these thousands of people out there is who march and everything else, is, who put their lives in danger that we don't give honor to, don't give credit to, and don't understand the roles that they play. Because to have a real movement that's similar to what we had at one time is we must be understand, understand you know, you know, wrap our arms around the people. Just because a person wears his pants low, it should not be a reason for them not to be let into the door, you know. And so, you know, and worry about that, you know, be worried about the wrong end anyway. So I think that we have to begin to look at how do we build families and rebuild communities, which we don't have anymore. We deserve the communities. And that's not, uh, you know, by accident. That was an intentional act on the part of this country to destroy what I consider to be the civil rights movement. You know, so uh, one of the things I think about, if you look at it real carefully, is this 1964 Civil Rights Act, you know, uh, actually became like a Trojan horse of the civil, civil rights movement. What I mean by that is we didn't think about all the things that was connected to it that was used to destroy the movement rather than to protect it, to make it, or to grow, and to be, be uh, equity and equality for all people. So we can talk you, about that uh, as we move forward. Could you talk about that a little bit more? That yeah, that... well, we came, uh, the challenge to the uh, Democratic Party in 1964 really challenged power. Uh, we really didn't understand what power really was until we, uh, to that, or at least I didn't, until then. Uh, we got right to the door, you know, and they slammed the door on us. I mean, when power really acted, I mean, we had the credentials committee just about wrapped up in our hands as, as after um, uh, Ms. Hayman gave her testimony before the credentials committee. We had it wrapped up. And Johnson and the others went through the back door. And they, they threatened people that, that overnight. The next day is some of the uh, members of the credentials committee. If you don't change your vote, your husband's up for a judgeship, that's gone, you know. You got this, that's gone, you know. And so they were threatened. I mean, even in terms of our lawyer at that time was Joe Rao, who was the attorney for the uh, Teamsters Union, Walter Ruth with them. But Walter Ruth went to Joe Rao and said, you don't change this around this, you losing your job. All of that happened within the 24-hour period pieces. So that's when power acted and they, and they, and they, they, they changed the whole thing about uh, 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 we were able to get the seats to the Democratic Party pieces, but we came close, too close. So this country then at that particular time made a, a concerted effort to fact is that this would never happen again. And so one of the ways of not doing that is they begin to attack what they knew would be the, the which is the strength of the, of, the, of the black community. And that happens to be the community. We had families. So they went after that structure. The first thing they did was he came out, if you recall, right? you know, was they call the Monaghan Report. The Monaghan Report became the directive was at the family structure of the black uh, the black, black family tr structure, whereby we were blamed for the problems of racism, the impacts of, of, of racism, you know, because the, the, the uh, black father was not in the home and, the, and uh, not taking consideration. The fact is that as soon as we were brought in this country, enslaved people, the first thing they did was, was separate the families, you know, so, that was the first thing about it. And some people bought into that in this piece. Then you got the poverty program, which looked good on the services, but what it did, really did, if you look at it, was to drain the black leadership out of the black communities, and they ran across the track. Took them from the big jobs, what you have is the main, main offices of the poverty program did not exist within the black community, it existed across the track. And so they got out there. You had the whole thing is we had at that particular time, business, the whole thing about we didn't have business, didn't have capitalization in the black community. That is not true. We had all grocery stores, stores, you know, you take them places around there. They had 
you know, like Wall Streets, whatever you have. You talk Austin, Texas. You talk about the fact of North Carolina. You talk New Orleans, whatever you have is. You had great uh, businesses across the country. Atlanta, whatever you had. You know, Petersburg, Virginia, you had it. So the first thing to destroy that piece is, so the attack on that is, was that they having to have grocery stores and stuff like this. And you had your Piggly Wigglies and Wiggly Pigglies or whatever you have is, who was able to sell groceries. They put their stores not to, into the community per se, but on the outskirts of the communities, but they sold cheaper. And so the boycott in terms of the fact that black pigs and black stores and stuff like that could not get the same uh, prices, it breaks in terms of that. So they, their uh, food and stuff was uh, higher prices than what the white store. In right. fact, it was so crazy in, in Mississippi, they had a store called Jitney Jungle that was around the, closer to the black community. And then to the white community, you had the same store, they called it Jitney Premier. So to give you an idea how this whole thing was operating. Mm -hmm. Blacks tried to come together to you know form larger grocery stores, other cities, but their problem was they couldn't get the loans downtown. Mm -hmm. So you blocked it. So all of a sudden, you got a whole shift in terms of where the uh, the uh, financial structure happens have been. The other piece happens to be is if that wasn't enough, is how you deal with the culture in the, those businesses that still existed, the communities and the communities, they call it urban renewal. And so if you look at the place, they, uh, to me is they put those ex expressways and others across the country, but most of them, and especially in the South and other places, they went straight through the black community mm -hmm. and basically where the business sections existed. New Orleans, it was Claiborne Avenue. It wasn't uh, St. Charles Avenue, the most beautiful street. In New Orleans, it was Claiborne Avenue, where Blacks used to come between Orleans and St. Bernard Avenue, Claiborne, beautiful trees, picnic all year, during the summer and everything else is. All that's gone. Business on both sides of the street. Mississippi, uh, Mississippi had Farris Street, whatever it's now, it's all boarded up and everything else because the fact is that no, no business exists there in the So it's a drain where on do, the community. Where do you think this has all brought us to today? I mean, what where... The the movement sort of, you know, if we look at it historically, we had all of these we have Mississippi movement, the Louisiana movement, um, but it it certainly seems like we've still got a long way to go. And and how do you see what what you all did back then coming forward to today, and how we can move that forward? Well, you have to re talk about rebuilding. I mean, uh, the this country has a way of every 60, 70, 75 years, so as it goes, it surge forward and it surge back. I mean, uh, the 1964 was not the first Civil Rights Act, right? 1876, and I was the Civil Rights Act. And what happened in that is, and then you got the whole piece about uh, making progresses. I mean, the Ku Klux Klan back in those, in those, those particular days was declared to be a, terrorist organization, you know, in the uh, 19th century, you know, that's that's real. And so then you have what you call the uh, Rutherford B. Hayes Compromise, whereby, similar to what you have in here, if you look at it, you know, the surge back, surge forward. You know, politically is the political deal there was is that for Rutherford B. Hayes to become president is that was a deal made. The deal was they would take out the, the, the move, remove the, uh, the restrictions on the Ku Klux Klan, the lobby, take out the soldiers out of the country and gave it back to what they call the Dixocrats, right? So the Dixocrats ran the South, all right? So that whole thing, we came back to segregation, you had the Jim Crow laws, but back in the effect is, and constitutionally they were done. The uh, Civil Rights Act of 1876 was considered to be unconstitutional, you know? And so the, and that the 14, 15 uh, amendment, the 13, 14, 15 amendment did not apply anymore. So, you have that is if you think about what happened then, you know, the civil rights act and what's happening now with the voters' rights act and everything else is it's quite similar in terms of that particular pattern. Mm -hmm. It took time is in terms for that to build. So you take from 1964 until now, what has been happening very slowly happening down the line. So it's not just, you know, you, you got the, the Reagans and you know and, and others. When Reagan came became president uh, uh, announced as president of the United States is okay. If you recall this, that he set the uh, standards about changing the direction of this country to the to the, more to the right. So where does he make this announcement? At? Slap in the face, everybody. Neshoba County, the same place as where Cheney Goodman swung with murder. 
right at the Neshoba County Fair. Right. If you read that, it's a blueprint where we are today. So this has been in the process of 1968, if you look at it is, as they search back pieces in 1968 is, uh, white males uh, left the Democratic Party, uh, a Dixocrat piece, and they said, let them have it, you know, and they went all to the Republican Party, all right? Because the Republican Party, if you recall, was a part of Lincoln, that's where a lot of most of the blacks were outside of the South. And uh, But because in the South is, we, it, the challenge, when we did do the challenge to the Democratic Party, because that's the only party that really had any power resistance. So if you don't do anything, you had to deal with the uh, challenge to the Democratic Party. So that's why it was that piece is. But the, the, in 1968, white and Georgia white males left the, uh, the uh, Republican Party and went to the Democratic Party. So if you look at that history piece, it's how it existed. That's when the whole piece began to really gel in the country. Wow. It's not about a Trump, you know? I mean, people keep talking about Trump and then Trump and the Trump. This is, it's not about Trump. Uh, it's about the people who are following, not following, but leading to Trump's group, right? You know, that's a whole lot of people. Mm -hmm. You talk about 40, 50 percent, you know, people, that's a lot of people in this country. So it's not, it's a whole culture system, you know, that we're up against at the, at the present time. It's that's in the, been in the making for a number of years. Well, I I can't, um, we we still have a little bit of time and I, and I can't let you go without talking about your book a little bit. Um, how, how did you and your son come to, to write this book about your experiences? Well, the, uh, there have been a lot of people after me about telling my story and I, I didn't want to do it. It's a very painful thing to deal with uh, because I, I lost a lot of friends during that period of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was in Mecca one hour before he, before he was assassinated. I was with Cheney Goodman sworn in 24 hours before they were murdered. And during that period of time of my involvement in the movement, we lost 19 people that people don't talk about you know, that were murdered. So the talk about that is, is these families and things of that nature that you have to relive and think about. And then how do you get the story out? And so my son, from a very small kid, he came up with us, you know, with the uh, listening to these people and these stories and stuff. He always talked about, I want to write your story, Dad, I want to write your story. So he's the one who pushed me when he went to, he went to a school and I mean, journalism, graduated and stuff like this. He really got it in his head. He wanted to do this. And he kept after me. So it, was, it, was, it, so it started out really about him and I, because he uh, talked about he wanted to know more about his dad because he felt that he didn't know his dad. I didn't understand what he was talking about this. And so as we got more and more to the book, I began to understand about this relationship. I did not know anything about, uh, uh, understand anything about PTSD. And so we in the movement spent years writing out, I mean, non nonstop. I mean, something was happening every day. Mm -hmm. uh, in the movement, and I stayed in the movement uh, without coming out doing anything. It's not even vacation from 1961 to 1965, and you just don't, you know. I mean, uh, so I didn't understand what impact it had, and so, but so therefore, I didn't have any understanding about the impact that I was having on my family as I grew older and uh, in life is and his coming up and stuff like this. It, and so our conversation, one of the things in the book he does is, is that he didn't tell me about it until the very end, by the way, that he writes me five letters mm -hmm. that he shares in the book about this relationship and stuff like that. So in a way, it brought us close together as a father son. I mean, we always have been close, but this really brought us in terms of knowing, you know, each other is, I mean, I talked to him about twice a day, every day, you know, he just calls, he just, hey, hey, what's up, dad, you know, kind of stuff is. And um, so that's how it came about is. And so it's, it's a story that he writes and it's more what I think of more of his passion than my, I told him the story. And also it was good for him because most of the people we talk about in that is uh, are the people that he came up with and knew at one time personally. He, you know, he mm -hmm. met them, talked to me. Bob Moses used to take his bed when he comes to places, you know. So people of that nature, he began to love and he calls them all. Uncle Bob, Aunt, uh, Janet, or whatever he has to be, you know, is his aunt and uncles and stuff like this throughout the movement. So it became, he's part of that big family. 
that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning of it and how it began to grow uh, was was through uh, his eyes and his feelings going up in this piece. Uh, but at the same time, it's the whole idea of what the family uh, being beyond just biological family. So mm -hmm. you got a better understand about that is so he's the one who came from him uh, in terms of his feelings that made it, I think the book uh, successful as well. Zeta, he made the story come on. And what it did also was he, he understood this whole thing about all these other people that made the movement. You know, it wasn't just these icons because what they did was they were telling mm -hmm. stories about people that you don't read about. You know? Right. You know, Mr. Trumbo, but I was just like, hey, you know, Mr. Trumbo did this, blah, blah, blah. Uh, C.O. Chen did this, you know. And so names of people, as he began to look at, go back and try to find who the hell are these people that they were talking about, you know. And so we have this the movement. What we have to begin to do is, is be, you know, understand that you don't have to be. It's not these uh, people who tell me all the time, well, we need another Martin Luther King. but we need another Bob Moses. There'll never be another Bob Moses. There'll never be another Martin Luther King. You know, and everybody, there's a piece of the movement in everybody. You got to have a desire to feel, or want to be, you know, free, uh, you know. So you, that's what it takes to come out. So you don't know where that great leadership is, but the leadership of the movement was, was about the accumulation of the whole lot of people, you know. Uh, there's a story that, uh, if I have just one minute. Have mm -hmm, this, sure, you yeah. have time. To me, it really tells me what courage is all about is and when you talk about fear and all this stuff. So we used to have these days of freedom vote days whereby people come out as many as we possibly can or usually on a Friday to try to register to vote. And it's really a demonstration uh, to uh, refute the uh, the idea that people are trying to spread in the country is that blacks were not registered to vote because they were complacent and didn't want to do it. We say, no, it had all these things happening. I mean, to try to register to vote it's almost like a death wish, you know, sign off. Because people were getting killed and beaten and stuff like this. It's just about trying to register the vote. So we do that to give that demonstration. So these are real heroes to me because people coming out and trying, knowing they couldn't do it, facing, you know, the, uh, the white supremacy, uh, supremacy, I don't know, uh, as they did, that is, and knowing that they had to go back in those backwoods or places, you know, to face them every day, sheriffs and whatever you have is. But they did it. So one day we were there in Canton, Mississippi, and I heard this clippity clop, and I look around. There was this uh, uh, old elderly couple in a wagon with a horse, a mule is what the horse, a mule, coming up. And they came right up to the courthouse. There is an old gentleman had his, what Sunday go best. He had a pair of overalls on, a white shirt and a tie, and a hat. And the lady had on a bonnet, a long dress. I'll never forget it. And he got up and said, hi, y'all, hi, your son. And he held, helped her down off the wagon. He looked at us and he said, where do I go to vote for George Raymond? George Raymond was a very brave young kid who was a civil rights worker out of New Orleans who was working in Canton, Mississippi. So he was, for some reason, he thought he was coming to vote for George Raymond. We told him George wasn't running for anything else, but this was uh, where you go to register to vote. In case George decided to run, you can vote for him. So he said, okay, if I do this, I can vote for George Raymond's chest. So he took his, I'm assuming that's his, his wife, up to, up, to, up to the courthouse. And he went by the sheriff, whose name was Billy Noble, and just looked him in the eye and kept walking. And he had these whites on the side, spitting the tobacco out, looking at him, pointing their finger at him. They didn't care. They went in and tried to register the and they came back out. And he helped her and he said, thank you, son. Y'all have a nice day. And he helped on the wagon, he got out the wagon, turned the wagon up and left clip the clock. Clip the clock. I'll never forget that. Because I wake up sometime at night wondering whatever happened to them. That was bravery. Mm -hmm. That was fighting fear all those years. The back there in those backwoods, not even having a car, but on that particular day, say for face the, the devil. That and that is a powerful story. When I read the book, that one stood out 
to me as well as just an amazing thing that those people did. Just amazing. Right. And so those are what we need to remember as we talk about move from, you know, what life is all about is and what can we do or what should we do or what am I willing to do? I mean, a lot of us are where we are today and a lot of people, you know, have a life that they have on the good side is because of people like that. It wasn't us, you know, um, uh, we hit rolled on that couple's back on their shoulders, which helped me and a lot of us, you know, do what we did. They are the ones who really paved the way. So that's what we mean when we say the movement made us. We didn't make the movement. What What would you say to young people today in terms of trying to change things for the better? There's got to be something that makes them angry about what's going on today. It's got to be something. Mm -hmm. So em embrace it. You know, I mean, um, I do know this much about it. These young people who are stuck in these areas, these places, they're not communities anymore. Mm -hmm. They intentionally put areas whereby they end up fighting against each other and what we have is they don't want to be there. You know? you know, we need to figure out how to help, you know, open that door to help them to get out of the areas, embrace them. Um, but they have no nothing to hold on to. So, but young people who do have something to hold on to need to begin to, you know, embrace this and try to figure this out. So we're working with our young people today is to try to say, you know, to them, there is a way out. I mean, what do you value in your life? You know, and so, uh, and how do you begin to change that? that Mm -hmm. and value something that's going to be, you know, beneficial to you. What is that? So the whole idea about family. So we all can help this out. I mean, we're young people. I mean, our elders have an obligation. When I grew up, the elders helped me. They put support for me, you know. I mean, they were there for us, you know. I mean, uh, when we were in the movement, we, we worked. Uh, we got 15 to $25 a week in order to do the work we did. Out of that came, you had to pay you rent, car, gas, food, everything out of that. So a lot of days we went to bed hungry, you know. And all the people is, I mean, some of the best uh, chicken sandwiches I've ever had is, is walking through the door trying to get people ready to vote is, and somebody come out, uh, Sonny, you hungry, you know? Would you like to have a sandwich? And they had to fry a chicken. That's why you take a double slice of Wonder white wonder bread and wrap it around a drumstick. Man, man that was good. You know? <laughs> you know, and so, but it's the appreciation, you know, that she had is and what we had in turn to live with, you know. And um, I met a, 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 a young person, not young, he's my, about my, a little bit young, he's younger than me. And he reminded me of something. Is he says, Dave, do you remember me? When um, I say, sure, his name is Hezekiah Watkins. Mm. I know you as a guy, you know, he's a freedom rider and worked in the civil rights movement in Mississippi. Yeah. He said, no. He said, when I was a kid, you know, you took me in for a couple of weeks and fed me and stuff. Like, you had some of the best food, man. He said, because I was poor, I didn't have any place to live. And you said, come on, stay with us until you get to, until you find your parents and stuff, get you together, find your place to stay. And uh, he said, you remember that? And I lied to him. I said, oh, yeah, I don't remember. It. You know, <laughs> you know and um, so I ask people all the time is if a, if a young person came up to you with his pants hanging down and stuff like that is, would you walk away from him or you talk to him? Would you have a conversation with him? Or you'd be concerned by the fact that he had his pants low? You know? I mean, how do we begin to reach out you know, and look at the fact is, say to to them, you know, you are one of our children, you know, and and begin to work for that. You know, that what do we do for our 
our children. I'm watching what's happening in schools today and stuff like this. I mean, how do people, how do we allow this to happen to our children? You know, instead we're looking at our, who's our, our large child is and say, as long as it's not happening to him but her. Mm -hmm. You know, but all of these children, uh, so when, when I grew up is, when we had uh, real communities, you know, the children or the children of the community, you know, and how do we bring that back? You know, so we need to figure out how to rebuild our communities and or take them back. These old dilapidated houses, rebuild them, you know. Um, That's we, a powerful place to to begin to wrap this up we we do have the after session um so we'll have another half hour with mr dennis um and i see that the link has just gone up um but looking at the children as the children of the community i think is is something that we really have lost and and you're underscoring the importance of that is very powerful. Um, there are many points in the book by the two Mr. Dennis's are very powerful. Um, for me, it 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 filled in the spaces uh, between those things with the people we hear about and all the people who were there doing the work. Um, that that felt very important to know about that it wasn't um, you know Martin Luther King may have been very important but he wasn't the only one doing the work and so on um, and stories of young people being taken in back then who didn't have a place to go and so things in some ways haven't changed too much but the work, the work has to go on. And if you haven't read um, the two Mr. Dennis's book, The Movement Made Us, it is something you should pick up and read. You'll learn so much and you'll feel so much about what it must have been like. Um, so you've used that phrase just to wrap up a couple of times that we didn't make the movement, the movement made us. Just, can you just explain that one more time as we go out? But the, yeah, uh, what I meant by that, what uh, Davey meant by that too, is that the, uh, there was a movement around at the time, it began at the time that enslaved people were first brought into this country. They always with some form of resistance that was there. And so the people who came afterwards on that particular show was there. So a lot of people give credit to the fact is to say that the young core people, the young SNCC people and the SCLC and the ACP, they didn't want to create the movement. It's as if the movement began with their work and stuff. And so my, what that means is that uh, these were organizations, the organizations were made up of the people the people made the organization. The organization did not make the people, the movement. So therefore, in terms of the movement, it was uh, uh, was there. And so we didn't make the movement. The movement made us, created, you know, helped us to be who we are. and took us where we are today as, as the people who were there. And Thank right, you. And now is the question is, how do we get recognition to those people? Thank you so much for the, this past hour has been amazing. And we're not finished yet, so I hope everyone will um, click on that link and come to the after session. And I see Reggie is back with us. Are you going to yes. take us out, Reggie? I am. And I'm going to say thank you so much to Mr. Dennis. Uh, Dave Dennis, you have been a very powerful witness of the movement making those who came through it and leaving us such an amazing legacy of how to keep persevering. Uh, I remember seeing you on on the films and TV, uh, had the opportunity to see you in 2014 at the um, uh, reunion of Mississippi Summer. 
Um, oh. Such a powerful voice for change in America. And folks, you have an opportunity to ask a question or two. Uh, join us in the after talk. Uh, the link is in uh, the chat and um, you can join us there. We'll have some time uh, for Mr. Dennis to also entertain your questions. Remember, the songs of the civil rights movement talked about community. They talked about the fact that people were not working alone. They were working in solidarity and in community to keep themselves on the path and keep their eyes on the prize. So as they sang, ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching up the freedom land. They were not marching by themselves and we don't have to march by ourselves either because together, we are more powerful than we are alone. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Please be generous. And uh, if you have the means, we ask that you be generous in your donations to the work and the mission of the Living Legacy Project. You can go on our website for information and also to see past uh, webinars. Uh, they're all recorded and they're all available there for you. See you in the question and answer. The link is right in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dennis. It okay, was an honor question? and a pleasure. Thank you, mine also.